who works with business owners, executives, and sales teams to help them present their stories more effectively. Tonight, Mark will be sharing four keys to communicating with clarity and helping you share your story and information more effectively, leading to improved results. So let's give a warm welcome to Mark Vickers. Thanks, Marcia. Thank you. One of the biggest challenges I find when I'm working with business owners and executives and salespeople is most of them are under this illusion that they're effective communicators. And especially when I'm talking with business owners, I'll ask them, okay, how do you know you're an effective communicator? And they'll typically say, well, my staff told me I was. Or alternatively, my spouse said I was a good communicator. I did a really good job in that presentation. To which I respond, you realize you're taking advice from the people you pay and the person you sleep with. Those are not the right people to critique your communication skills. Most executives go under this illusion that they're highly effective until for some reason they get a professional critique of what they're doing. And then all of a sudden they realize that they're not connecting with their audience the way they really need to. They can't figure out why they're not closing sales the way they should, why their staff is not responding the way they would like them to. And it's because they're not connecting properly. I fell into that trap. I spent 22 years in corporate IT, and now I teach people how to communicate. That just doesn't seem right, but it is. But when I started speaking professionally, which means you actually get paid to speak, which is really cool. I had a videographer, kind of like what we had tonight. I was down at the University of Miami. I had 350 of the top student leaders in a room on a Saturday morning. Gave my presentation. I thought it was awesome. And the audience applauded, and there were tears and all sorts of good stuff. I got my check, went home. The video showed up about two weeks later. And I watched that video and thought, OK, that is not what I remember having done. Like, it looked like me, but it's what I remembered was way better. So I thought I was probably just being way too hard on myself. So I found myself a speaking coach, and I sent it off to him. But a week later, he sent me an email. He said, call me. So I called him. He said, well, you're right. It was really bad. And he said, you need to learn a lot about how to connect with people. You need a lot of practice. So I went out on the public seminar circuit, spent seven and a half years. I was on the road anywhere from 35 to 42 weeks out of the year. Racked up, now I think it's at 6,500 hours in front of audiences. Used a lot of that time to figure out when you're speaking to a group, how do you actually connect to them? Discovered those same things work when you're talking one-on-one. -on -one. They work when you're in a business meeting. It doesn't matter what the setting is, it's all the same techniques. And that's where the name of my company came from, Speaking is Selling. Because I had this realization that it doesn't matter what we're doing, we are always speaking and we're always selling something. Now I know some of you right now are saying, oh no, I'm a marketing person, I'm not a salesperson. Especially if you're internal to a corporation, right? You think, I don't sell nothing. <laughs> Wrong. Because what do you sell every day? Okay, so you're selling programs. Let's think even more fundamental. What are you personally in the office every morning selling? Yourself. Yeah, you start with yourself. You're selling yourself every minute of every day. And then you're selling your ideas, your plans, your projects, your, your designs, your whatever it is you're doing. And if you think about it, you started selling when you were like this tall. Did any of you have a mother, father, aunt, uncle, grandmother that said, you do not need one more cookie? Did anyone, were you told that? That was your first rejection of your sales proposition. Because you thought you'd made this compelling case of why you would simply die if you didn't have that one more cookie. And they shot you down. You thought it was a compelling case, they didn't buy it. Think of all the things you've tried to sell. Now, because most people don't think of it that way, they don't put the pieces together and say, hey, how do I sell more effectively? Most people assume that's only for salespeople. The name of my book is Speaking of Selling, 51 Tips Your Mother Taught You. Okay. 
A lot of it is simple common sense things that we just don't think about. And tonight we're going to talk about the four keys to communicating with clarity. Now these four keys, when you really learn them, when you really internalize them, they will start to work their way through every type of communication you do. Whether you're asking questions, you're making a real presentation, you're selling. I have clients all the time say, you know, I can't believe how much better life is at home. My wife, my husband, my spouse has noticed that something has changed because people change the way they communicate. So let's talk about the four keys. And then we're going to get some of you up here to practice a little bit. That's the fun part. Well, that's the fun part for me. Maybe not so much for you, but I'll have a good time. The first key to clarity is called substance. What do you have to say that's actually important? And I know your first reaction, well, everything I say is important. Let me rephrase it. What do you have to say that is important to the person you're speaking to? See, they don't care about you. They really don't, they care about themselves. So what do you have to say that's really important to them? And the question is, how do I figure out if it's important to them? Well, there's two steps to this process. The first step is to identify what is your intent in having that conversation. What do you want to achieve? Now, you have to be very, very careful in this. And, and Wally, I'm going to pick on Wally a little bit because I, I know a little bit about Wally's business and I know uh, Wally well enough to know that I can use him as an example because he doesn't do what I'm about to say. But Wally, when he's out selling his service, he could go into the interaction with a homeowner thinking, I want them to buy my services. And Wally, would that be the right thing for you to go in thinking in that first interaction with a potential customer? Typically not. No, typically not. See, the sale is the end result. It's not your primary intent of that first conversation. What do you want to achieve in that first conversation? You want to connect them, you want them to like you, sure. There's actually five things you want them to do very, very quickly. And if this is the only thing you remember from tonight, that'd be awesome. In your initial conversations, in the early stages of any relationship with anybody that you're trying to work with or motivate or influence, you need to help them understand that you are likable, relatable, trustable. We're going to stop at those three first. Likable, is that one pretty easy to understand? People want to do business with people they like. So be likable. Don't be a jerk. Relatable. This one's a little bit tougher. What does it mean to be relatable to the person you're speaking with? Speak to their level. Speak to their level. Let's refine that just a little bit because some people would say, oh, I have to dumb it down or something. Tell me a little bit more about what you mean because you're on the right track. That is absolutely critical. You're, you're still on the right track. I want to refine it a little bit. Have something in common. Have something in common with them. Have something in common with them. Because they want to know that you're kind of like them. <clears throat> Think of the story that I use when I start. I make it very clear that I am now a professional, certified, world-class speaking coach. I spend my days helping people communicate, but I have not always been good at doing this. I was a mess. I was really bad. People paid me for it anyway. Still can't figure that out, okay? By me sharing the story that I was really bad and not some career professional speaker that's always been a good, a good speaker, does that help make me a little bit more like everybody else? Yeah, there's no naturally good speakers. We're all a mess until we figure it out. Relatable is so important. Otherwise, you create a barrier between you and your customer. Now, that barrier can sometimes be because you are so good at what you do and you are so knowledgeable at what you do and they haven't got a clue about what you do that it can be difficult because they simply don't understand you. So, and that's where talking to their level, and that's why I said you were on the right track, to have that commonality, sometimes you have to stop being you for a minute, the professional you, and just be the personal you. Find a way to connect with them. Find something, anything. So we got likable, relatable, trustable. Why is trustable critical? You don't want to do business with somebody you perceive as dishonest. 
says, yeah, you don't want to do business with someone that you just simply don't trust. How easy is it to put off a vibe that you are not trustable? It's very easy. It's very easy. You can turn someone off in a heartbeat. And the problem is, typically when it happens, we don't even know it happened. So I'm going to give you some things to uh, try later on that will help you identify if that's maybe been a problem. And it's not that you've done anything intentional. It's not that you're not really a trustable person. But when you communicated, there was something just really minor that you did that pushed them away. Now, those first three are critical. The next two determine how quickly you're going to make the sale or close the deal or motivate them to do whatever you need them to do. So after you've convinced them that you are likable, relatable, and trustable, now you move to knowledgeable and valuable. A lot of people think, aren't those the same thing? No. Those are very, very different things. Knowledgeable means you actually know something about what you're talking about, and hopefully you know something that I don't know. Because if I know everything you know, then you're not really all that knowledgeable to me. But valuable. Valuable is not only do you know your stuff, but you know how to use your stuff in my world for my benefit. The minute you make yourself valuable, you tear down almost all of the barriers between you and that other person. Now, being valuable, if they don't like you, trust you, can't relate to you, is going to be almost impossible. So that's why we sequence these things the way we do. But if you, in the first two minutes, can achieve likable, relatable, trustable, knowledgeable, and valuable, the rest of that conversation is going to be a piece of cake. And I don't care if you're sitting in a boardroom with a prospective customer, you're at a networking event, or you're on the main stage of a major conference. It's always the same process. Now, once you've determined your intent, and you've figured out how you're going to do those things, then there's one more important question under substance. What is the single, one single, most important thing you need them to hear? Most salespeople make one fundamental mistake. They believe that the customer needs to understand everything there is to know about their product, services, and what they do. The customer doesn't care about your features, your benefits, your products, and your services. And I know for many people that's really hard to hear. What does your customer actually care about? They care about solving their problem. Ultimately, that's all they care about. So what they want to know is, can you help solve my problem? I don't even want to know the details in most cases, at least not up front. I want to know that I can trust you, and that you know enough to do it, and that you've got a plan on how to do it. Because you show me you can solve a problem and ask my wife. You convince me you can solve my problem, I will buy before I even know what the price is which is part of the reason I'm not allowed to negotiate anything in our house anymore. I'm, I'm really not. Because she knows I'm an easy, I'm, one of, I'm either your worst nightmare as a customer, or I'm your easiest sell. I'm one or the other. Easiest sell is to a salesman. Yeah, the easiest sell is to a salesman. It's also the fastest sale to lose. Because good salespeople know what they're looking for, and you tweak me in that first 30 seconds, oh, you're going to have a rough day. Okay. Ask a car salesman that's at a dealership not that far from here. Because this is what can happen without even knowing that you've done it. I decided that it was time to get a new car. And actually, Debbie told me it was going to be OK to actually go and buy it. We ended up on the car dealer lot. We were, we were there like 9 o'clock. I'm standing beside the car that I ultimately bought. I had my hand on the hood of the car. Sales rep comes out and says, hey, can I help you? That is not a good start. Because in my mind, being a little twisted, what am I thinking? <laughs> well, I went there eventually. But you say, can I help you? I'm thinking, I don't know, can you? That's just a stupid question. So I don't even answer him. His follow-up question is, so um, what are you looking for today? <laughs> This. So, are you looking for a car? Mm -hmm. 
Then, without asking me any questions, he says, well, let me show you under the hood. I'm not a car guy. I like my car. I love my car. I want a car that I can step on the gas pedal and it goes fast. What's under the hood, I could care less. He opens the hood and he's showing me stuff that I don't even know what it is. I walk away. I get in the car. I am now sitting in the car, hands on the steering wheel, foot on the gas pedal. I'm going for a drive, whether he's with me or not. He comes around the side of the car and he says, well, what are you thinking? Would you like to take it for a test drive? <laughs> he is very lucky that I already knew that it was the only one of those cars with the color scheme in town that I wanted. Otherwise, I would have walked. Instead, I just continued to harass him for about as long as I could, including all the way through the negotiation process. What if he had come out and said, that's an awesome car? How much more would he have had to have said other than that? He could have said, that's an awesome car. You want the keys? Uh -huh. And we're done. Bring out the paperwork with the keys. I'm signing. But instead, people don't think about what they're saying. So when I talk about substance, this is a very intentional process. When you're out talking with your customers, when you're selling your product services, when you're presenting a proposal, when you're doing whatever you're doing, be incredibly intentional. What is your intent? What's the intent of this conversation? Maybe it's just to get them to like you. Maybe it's to get them to agree to a meeting. Figure out what that most important point is and then deliver it. That's substance. Now, once you've started to give some, now, before we go on to the next step, do you currently spend that much time and effort thinking about what the heck you're going to say to someone? Very few people do. And if you look at the difference between highly successful sales and marketing people and everybody else, what do you think one of the differences is? It's preparation. It's how much time they spend getting ready for that interaction. So identify your substance. Now, here's the fun one, and this gets to something that you were mentioning earlier, simplicity. Simplicity is my single favorite topic to work with groups on. Simplicity is not about dumbing down your message. Simplicity is about making your message easy to understand quickly so they can understand, interpret, and act on it. And here's how I want you to picture it. In fact, we've been here, you've been sitting down 20 minutes, 25 minutes. In the time that you've been sitting here, has, raise your hand, has your cell phone vibrated? Anyone's cell phone vibrated? A couple. Did you check it? Just the number. Just the number. He checked it. <laughs> Anyone check their email while they've been sitting here so far? Yeah, those of you that are you know, pretending you're typing on your phone, I know, you see an email pop out, you've got to check it. I know, I know the game. Have you thought about what you did at work today? in the last 20 minutes? Have you thought about what you have to do at work tomorrow? Have you wondered where your family is because your cell phone has not vibrated in the last half hour? Right? All these things are going through our brain. So the human brain, think of it as a whole bunch of little time slices. It's all these time slices, and they're really short. We have incredibly short attention spans now. So people have these really short attention spans, and you're trying to put a message in that's this big. It don't fit. You try to put this message into that little time slice, and their eyes will start rolling into the back of their head. Now, they may not, you may not see it, but mentally that's what's happening. You've just lost them. Your message is too complex for them to understand. And think about it this way. You go home tonight, you turn on the TV, maybe you flip on CNN. CNN, you've got the anchor, or two anchors, or four anchors, or six talking heads, depending on what they're doing. You've got one or two bars of scrolling stuff at the bottom. You have the temperature. You have the stock index. You may have something up top. And how many of those are you actually aware of at any point in time? You're actually aware of all of them. You may not know what each of them says, but you know they're all there because our attention has got so fragmented now Yet when you speak, I shouldn't say when you, when most people speak, they assume that their message is so important 
They can make it big and complex and people will still listen. They don't, they don't. This is where so many sales and opportunities are lost. We don't make it easy for people. People ask me all the time, what do you do? I help people tell stories to make their sales easier. How easy is that to understand? Now, sometimes you ask more questions. Well, then I get into more detail. But I help you tell stories more effectively. Pretty easy. They might say, why? Well, because right now sales is not enjoyable and it's not effective. They go, uh-huh. Well, better stories makes it more enjoyable and more effective. Simple, simple messages. The art of simplicity is taking whatever your message is and figuring out how to break it down into really small bite-sized pieces that are easy to deliver. Not insulting, not talking down to people, but just simple. Somewhere along the line, business people came up with this idea that we had to sound really fancy and sophisticated. Fancy and sophisticated doesn't work. Clear, common sense. Think about, it. Think about a sales situation where you've been dealing with someone in a technical field. How much do, do they just seem to enjoy throwing all those buzzwords out? Half the time you don't understand. Does that draw you closer to them or push you away? It pushes you away. We had a problem with our AC unit in our old house. And uh, the young guy that came out, he said, the, the what's it capacitor thingy of Bob on the fan is a little overrated and it's causing the fan to run a little high and, and ultimately it's gonna da -da -ba blah 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 blah. I went, huh? I said, look, I don't care. If this was your AC unit, what would you do? He said, I'd replace it in about two months because your fan's got about three months left. I said, that I understand. I don't need to know about the flux capacitor on the fan motor of my AC unit. I don't care. I wanna know when's it gonna break and I'm gonna be way too hot to sleep. <laughs> Tell me that, that's all I care about. Don't make your message so difficult. And when I have some of you up here and we're gonna role play some stuff, I guarantee what you think is a simplistic message can be simplified dramatically from where you are right now. So we've got substance, we've got simplicity. Then we have structure. The structure of your message and how you choose to deliver your message is so important. So many people don't take the time to start by just doing some good common sense rapport building. Well, if you don't do your rapport building, you certainly aren't gonna be likable, relatable, trustable. You haven't taken the time to be knowledgeable and valuable. You're just diving straight into your stuff. It's game over already. So do your rapport building. And then figure out how you're gonna transition into the core of whatever you're talking about. And I've got a client out of Dallas right now we're working with, and their salespeople, I love them. They're great kids. I call them kids because they're uh, looking around through. Yeah, okay, they're kids. Okay, they're like 20-somethings, most of them. Okay, they're the same age as some of you. For the rest of us, they're kids. When you watch them do their presentations, it's like this. Report building, report building, report building. Oh, stop report building. Now it's time for me to sell you some stuff. Oh, stop. Okay, now it's time for me to wrap up and ask you to sign the contract. And it is that disjointed. And they wonder why her close rate is running at about two and a half percent of all proposals delivered. Is there any business where a two and a half percent close rate is good? Let me add this, it takes eight to 12 weeks from the time they start with a prospect until they deliver the proposal. Can you imagine having 12 weeks of work in to deliver a proposal and only having a two plus percent conversion rate? They're not happy. Well, part of the reason that they're not connecting with their customers is this disjointedness in their presentation. So when we talk about the structure of your presentation, how are you gonna do your rapport building? All right. And once you've done some rapport building, well, then what are you gonna do? And then what are you gonna do? And, then what are you, and how are you gonna do it smoothly? How are you gonna transition from one thing to another? How are you gonna ask that person a question that gets them to ask you a question? Have you ever tried doing that? Have you ever been so intentional that you ask a question knowing full well that it's gonna cause them to ask you another question? Because if they ask you a question, what does that let you do? That you get to answer it. See, if they ask you a question, you can tell them everything you need to. 
But if you just try to tell them that, they don't care. See, they don't care until they think it's their idea to get the information. So you make them think it's their idea. But again, you have to be incredibly intentional about this process. On this one, please write this down or type it in. Take some time to build what's called a question library. And you're gonna have to practice with this. Uh, and, and for people that have been in their industry and been very successful, and, and, and I'm sure, Wally, I'm sure, because how long have you been doing what you do, Wally? How many years? 22 years. Okay. 22 years, Wally is successful in what he's doing. And happy anniversary, by the way. Wally will have certain questions that probably unintentionally, maybe intentionally, he knows work every single time he asks them. These questions get him to exactly where he needs to be because he's tried it. Oh, that didn't work. Try it again, try something different. Build a question library for the types of situations you run into. And what I want you to do, and what I challenge you to do, is when you go into that next situation, you're delivering a proposal, you're talking to a prospect, try those questions. And when you get back in the car, say, okay, that one didn't work, that one didn't work, this one worked really well. And start understanding why things work. Because that type of self-analysis is what's really gonna cause you to change and grow in how you communicate. Look at the expression on people's faces as you move from one thing to another. As I've been going through this, as I've changed from substance to simplicity to structure, what did I do each time I changed topics? I reviewed the previous ones. I would go back and say, okay, we've covered, uh, I just went blank on what we've covered. We've covered substance, we've covered simplicity, now we're covering structure. So I tie it all together. So I give you a smooth transition from one topic to another. It's not just, okay, we're done with that, let's move on to something else. <coughs> so every time you jolt people, you lose them. Now the fourth key, and then we're gonna start putting some of this into practice. The fourth key is style. Whether you're talking to one person or a thousand people, you need to have some style. Now, it doesn't have to be anything fancy, but how effective is a monotone salesperson? They're not. I wanna share with you the single word that over the course of your career can earn you hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Would you like to know what that magic word is? Yes, please. <laughs> silence. Very few people have the ability to use silence. If you were presenting in front of a group, could you sit and just look at people for that long and not say anything? It's hard. It's hard to sit here and say nothing. But it is so powerful. In a one-on-one -on -one situation, and a friend of mine is probably the best salesperson, probably the most successful salesperson I've ever met. Watching him do what he does is so uncomfortable. Because he will ask the customer a question, and then he just sits there and waits. He just waits. Because there's an old sale saying, he who, or she, speaks first, loses. Yeah. You don't want to be that first one to speak. There's so many times that that pause is important. Now, if you're asking questions, you have got to let people think about it and answer the question. If you've just made a powerful statement, you need to let them think. See, the power of silence, it's in that silence that the person you're talking to interprets and thinks and evaluates and connects with your message. If you don't give them that time, you have just freight trained your message. You've delivered so much content so fast that none of it is going to stick. This is my favorite pet peeve when I'm working with salespeople. Imagine this type of situation. We'll go back to our car salesperson. So what do you like about this car? And by the way, don't you love the red stripe and the rims are awesome. And, and by the way, did you see the way they did the interior detailing? Man, they put a lot of time and effort into designing this. 
what was the original question? What did you like about this? <laughs> I don't even know. If, was that what it was? So I don't even know because I just ran it all over it. Do you ever, and be honest, do you ever ask someone a question and then just keep on talking before they have a chance to answer the darn question? Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're not going to talk about X, Y. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's a rabbit hole that will get me in all sorts of trouble tonight. So many people do it. Yeah, it's a good thing it's X. That verbal overflow, and, and here's a couple of tricks to get past it. Now that you've heard this term verbal overflow, you're going to become very keenly aware of it starting like this evening, and you'll hear yourself doing it. Quite often what it is is we ask a question, we feel the need to explain the question we just asked. Well, if you need to explain what you just asked, where should that explanation be occurring? Before. before the question. Do your explanation before the question, and then ask the question. But see, we naturally, for some reason, we got it backwards. We ask the question, and then we explain the question, and by the time we're done explaining, we're going, what was the question again? We do it all the time. When you start to use stories, which is where I ultimately want you to get to, is to use stories anytime you're communicating. Here's the big one. Tell the story, not the backstory. Tell the story, not the backstory. When you're telling a story, and, and yeah, we'll pick on Mary now for a bit. Yeah. You have all sorts of client success stories, I'm sure, don't you? Mary could choose to tell a client success story about a situation that a client had. And she could tell the entire history of that client and the situation they were in and how they got there and the impact it was having and then what she did and how it turned out and all this other great stuff. Does the new client care about all that junk? No. They care about a little segment in the middle that says, well, that client was just like me. Mary knew how to fix the problem. Mary fixed the problem. All that backstory stuff, we don't want to include. Here's the problem. It's our story. We like our stories. So naturally, just intuitively, we want to share all of that detail. And as soon as we do that, we're losing our audience. Trim it down. Here's, here's a bonus one. I, wasn't, I hadn't even thought about this one. This one just popped in my head. Random thought. Uh, cut the fluff is another one when we talk about stories. Too often, people want to share all of the details. They want to use all sorts of words. It was an absolutely amazing, beautiful, gorgeous day. It was a nice day. It was a hot day. Again, it's simplifying the message by getting rid of a lot of that detail. Now let's talk about speed of delivery. In the however long we've been here so far, how often do I change the speed of my delivery when I'm speaking? Is it pretty regular? And I'll, you know, tonight we have video, so I'll be able to go back and actually watch it. It should be about every 30 to 45 seconds. Because every time I change the speed, tone, volume, something in my delivery, that re-engages you. Think back, we've got short attention spans. By changing things in how I'm delivering the message, it causes you to re-engage. I do the same thing one-on-one. -on -one. I'll talk really, really fast and then slow way down to make a point. I'll go quiet. I'll think. I'll get really excited. I'll go, oh, seriously? I'll maybe do something silly. All these things are about re-engaging the person you're speaking with. So, substance, simplicity, structure, and style. Those are the elements that when you really start to understand those, you can take those into any communication setting and start communicating with more clarity. Now, stories by far are the best way to relay information. People connect with stories. You've probably heard stories sell. I have a whole workshop I teach on why stories sell and the mechanics and the impact on the brain and all that technical stuff. Who cares? We're just gonna have fun with some stories. Because stories are such a great place to practice these four keys to clarity. Now what I'm gonna have you do is come up here and share a really short story. And then we'll make it shorter and more powerful. Because it's the best way I've found to help reinforce all of these techniques. 
So whether it's a networking story that you use, how you introduce yourself, a story about what products and services you sell, whatever you want to try, we're going to play around. And we've got, what, about half an hour, Marsha? Give or take? Yeah. So we can probably do about four or five and have a little bit of fun with it. So who wants to volunteer? And I always ask for volunteers before I volunteer you. And trust me, I will. So who wants to volunteer? Come on up. Big round of applause for John. I know we met earlier, but I got a short, short memory. So John, um, what, what sort of a quick little story do you want to share with us? Actually, a couple of people I kind of shared with already with Mary and I think Chris, they said, so John, what do you do? Because I'm actually here, I'm not in media or anything, I'm a project manager. Okay. So I go, okay, and then so most project manager kind of, I mean, what is that, right? So I said, well, everybody knows about drones, right? So, big buzzword, right? So I work with the Navy who's building a big drone and everybody's thinking, oh my gosh, it's that one that's got the propeller and the sneaks and you saw the movie and they shoot the Hellfire missile, bam. No, this this one is, uh, it's, it's a big, it's like a 737 airliner, it's that big. It flies way up in the air, all kinds of instruments can see everything, infrared, you know, heat, uh, radar, sig any, all these military things that are threats, okay? And that's all it does. It relays that information to the soldiers and sailors so they have real-time information. And, uh, you know, in the end, I, I really believe it helps protect our soldiers and it gives us the edge over uh, you know, whoever we're fighting. Okay, so question for the audience. Do you know what he does yet? Is it a private company or is it the military? Uh, I'm a contractor for the military. Okay, so that's a good question. What else don't you know yet? Because he's trying to introduce himself and what he does. What don't you know? What's that? What I do. Well, yeah, we don't know his name. <laughs> yeah, he forgot that part. What else don't we know? You introduce qualifications. <laughs> qualifications can be important, sure. What else don't we know? Very fundamental. What don't we know? What he's offering to share. Uh, we don't know what he does. He did not tell us what he does. He's a product manager. Okay, okay, which means nothing. It I means admitted nothing. That. I admitted that. <laughs> okay, so if you're introducing yourself, tell us something we care about. So what? Do, so forget about them. What do you okay. actually do? Uh, help the government manage a military program. In so are you a project manager? Are you a program manager? Project manager, and more specifically, schedules that are built build schedules, right? When anything you're creating something, you build a schedule, and that schedule gives you information on, you know, but deliver on time okay. and on cost. That's that's what I deal with. Now do you know what he does? Are you an engineer or an accountant? I'm not an engineer. I'm a project manager. It's kind of a little bit of both. All right. How about, how about just as an idea? Okay. I work for a private contractor for the military. I got the coolest job. You've heard of drones, right? Little drones, the big drones the military has. Imagine a drone the size of a 737. It's a spy drone, it's awesome. There are thousands and thousands of moving pieces in one of those. My job is to make sure there's a schedule in place to make sure they all end up in the right place at the right time. Your turn. I, I did save you a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't go away, it's your turn. Your turn, okay. So what did I do that was different than what he did? Painted a picture. Painted a picture? Painted a picture. Yeah. You said it was awesome. I said it was awesome. Yeah. It is. It's awesome stuff. He's building. Made stop recording for a second. He's building huge ass drones. Made That's, it interesting. Made it interesting. Yeah, I was a little bit excited about what he does. Yeah. Here's one of the things that drive me. I'm more excited about what he does than he is. That's wrong. <laughs> Unless you hate your job. Okay. I walk. I work with companies all the time, and I've had. I couldn't tell you how many times I've had this conversation with salespeople. If I can explain your company with more enthusiasm than you can, you should be fired. And in most companies I work with, I can. But what do you think the customer is going to respond to? That enthusiasm. Rick, you have a question? You made it into a commercial, but maybe you want to ask him more about it. Okay. Key thing. I'm saying things to get Rick to ask me questions. Because the minute he asks questions, I can start telling him whatever I want to tell him. Because now it's his idea to ask for more detail. It's not me doing a brain dump. It's him asking for it. Do you see the value in getting... That other person to ask? Hey, John, give us your introduction again real quick. 
<laughs> Hi, my sir? name's John Reinheimer. I'm a project manager. How many people out here have seen the movie Captain Phillips? Okay, now just, just briefly, that was a story about an American ship that got hijacked off Somalia, correct? This crew got captured and rounded up. You know, you get the picture. Tom Hanks was the captain in the ship, by the way. To make a long story short, we could not get satellites or aircraft over that ship to gather information for the snipers that had to go do their job. We have a drone, big drone, size of a 737. We have two prototypes. Most people don't know this, flying in the Middle East. One of those went up collected information with all its cameras and sensors, relayed that information in real time to the sniper team that was on the ship that got close, and you know the end of the story. They say they got rid of the pirates, saved the ship. So that's what I'm involved with is a, our country is building drones. This is specifically for the Navy. Okay, so pause. Uh, he's already gone four to five times longer than I did. Still hasn't told us what he does. Took us down a path, and here's the challenge with movie references, because I happen to love that movie. Well, I, don't know, I know everybody didn't see but, it. But see, that's part of the problem. When you use a movie reference, yeah. if you have to say, well, let me fill in the gaps for you, you've, you've got a problem. If you ever find yourself having to say, well, to make a long story short, well, you probably shouldn't have been telling the story in the first place. Okay? Just, again, because think about short attention span, right? It's got to be a short story from the beginning. It's not easy. It's not easy. But this, this session is all about you starting to be really intentional about how you do it and really starting to think about it. Big round of applause for John for coming up and playing. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. All right, who's next? Come on up, Mary. Could you do me a favor and grab me my bottle of water there? Thank you. Awesome. So this is a story. This is a case study about a client who came to us and she had purchased a logo from a company I shall not name, but it starts with Vistaprint. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, she, had, she brought the logo to us. She wanted us to modify it. It was taking a long time. She got a great deal, but she just needed it tweaked a little bit. And I said, can you go back and ask for a file that we can modify? Ask for an EPS file. She went back and she asked. And they said, no, we can't give it to you. And then I said, did you pay for this file? Yes, I paid for it. Does this file belong to you? Yes, it belongs to you, but they will not give me the file. Well, so I went back to their website to look it up to find out if she actually owned the logo. And in the small print it says, you can only use that logo on, on jobs that you create with us. You cannot take it any other place. You cannot trademark it. You cannot, you cannot use it on um, a website or on anything else that you have not done with us. So at the end of the day, she did not have a piece of intellectual property that would help her sell her business. Awesome story. Awesome story. Okay. Now, scary story. Now, we're going to make that awesome story awesomer. Okay. That's one of my words, by awesomer. Trademarked. Why would you share that story? What's, what's your intent in sharing that story? My intent is to let people know that when you buy logos online, they are not always yours, and you cannot always sell that as a piece of your business when you get ready to sell your business. Okay. Is that a really important message for small business and entrepreneurs to hear? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So what I'm going to challenge you to is to scare the heck out of them because okay. it's a great scare okay. story. And people respond faster to the fear of loss than the possibility of gain. Psychologically proven. If I scare you and tell you I'm going to take all your income away, you will react so fast, it'll blow your mind. If I say I'm going to give you a 10% raise, yeah, I might hear back from you next week. Okay, But I tell you, you're going to lose everything. You're going to react real quick. So the key things are intellectual property. You better know if you own it. And the cheapest way is not always the best way. Right? right? Is that kind of the core underlying message? Yes, what if you were to do something like this? It's like, look, um, what's your name? Lynn. Lynn. I, I have my contacts and I can't read name tags that far away. So I'm going to say Lynn's the client you're talking to. Okay, Lynn, I, I got to tell you, I understand price is important to you, but I've got to share with, with you what happened with one of my other clients. They took the least expensive route and used a web design firm for their logo. And in the end, they did not own that logo. They could only use it if they bought products from that company. They couldn't trademark it. They couldn't sell it. They couldn't use it on their website. Nothing. So. 
how cheap is that cheap solution if you can't use it for anything you want to use it for? Well said. Okay. <laughs> so what did I do? I, I said basically the same thing, right? I took out all the junk. And you know what I mean when I say junk. Of course. Yeah, you know, I took out all the stuff in the middle that, that built the story but served no real purpose. The key part of the story is you pay for a cheap logo, you don't own it, you can't use it, is that really a cheap logo? The it's answer is no. It's not yours. Mm -hmm. So it's finding a way to compress that message down. So try it again, Mary. Starting from the beginning? Yeah. Well, use, use Lynn as your client, just like I just did. Lynn, I appreciate that you brought this logo to us, and yes, we can help you. Where did you get the logo? I'm so sorry. This is hard. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, I, one, one tip, one yeah. tip. When you say, I'm so sorry, yep. um, don't smile. <laughs> I'm just saying. I, I know she does because I've met Mary before. But this, okay, you're all laughing, but this is really, really important. Do not underestimate the importance of it. This is such a terrible situation. I don't know how you're going to put up with it. Okay, you just lost trust. Your face better be congruent with whatever words you're saying. So if you're sorry and sad and upset about her situation, tone of voice, take the tone of voice down. A little bit more somber face. And for people that have a smiley face, it's hard. Because you do. You've got a, a naturally smiley face. It's tough. But you got to be aware of it. Okay. Lynn, I'm sorry. I've got bad news for you. The logo that you bought from the unknown company is not yours. In the small print, it says you cannot use it on anything other than um, products that you print with them. So you thought you had a really good deal with that logo. It's not yours, and you will not be able to have that as a piece of your intellectual property. It's not yours at all. I'm sorry. That's a pretty direct message, isn't it? The fluff is gone. And now, as a client, are you going, oh. Damn it. Do you feel like this tall? But do you trust Mary because Mary told you the truth? She was up front with you. She told you about the fine print. She's not playing games. She's not, she's telling you a story, but she's not telling you a big flowery story. She's getting to the point of saying, you messed up. People respect that. I saw a hand, Rick. I was just going to say, at the end of your story, you asked her a question. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was interesting because then there's, you know, in a way, a call to action. You said, was that worth it? So to that extent. And so now she has to respond, well, it wasn't, and then you start a dialogue of what's next up next Yeah, good catch, Rick. And I, and, I, and I do that, I guess I've just been doing it so long, I forget that I even do that. I end almost every conversation or, or statement with a question. Because I'm going to get her to validate what I just said. I'm going to get her to take accountability for it. I'm going to get her to take responsibility for it. I'm going to get her to admit she was wrong and I'm right without being rude about it. But you, you understand what I'm saying, right? We need people to take responsibility and accountability, and questions are the way you do that. So yeah, having a question at the end, and that's where just being intentional about how you use that story. Make a note of this. This is huge, and I'm doing a huge amount of work with clients on this right now. And, and we'll use it since you're up here, Mary. I'll use Mary as the example. What I do with my clients is I'll sit down and say, okay, Mary, let's go through the last five years of your business and pick out the top 10 stories you might want to use again. And we actually build a story library. And we perfect those stories so that you know you run into this logo situation. Oh, that story 2B, boom. And it's the same every time. Oh, you went for a cheap website. Oh, that story C, C5. I have one of those too. Oh, I'm sure you do in your business. Yeah. So you, you probably already know the story. So what I do with clients is we get so intentional is we have that story library so that when those situations, and this comes back to what you and I were talking about before the session even started, those standard responses. So when stuff comes up, you don't even have to think about what you're going to say. It's just right there every single time. And how much power is there to knowing exactly how you're going to address that situation when it comes up? That's big. That's oh, big. Thank you for playing, Mary. I appreciate it. All right. Yes, sir. Oh, you're volunteering. <laughs> come on down. Tell us a story, Chris. Hey, my name is Chris Jones. I work at web.com, and I do SEO for them. SEO is just a big term that means I help you get your site pushed up farther in Google, Google's rankings. So when someone searches something in Google, they see your brand, they see your product. It's so much better than people aren't paying attention to billboards anymore, or people don't watch TV hardly, they have Netflix. So 
And what I also do, I also um, learn strategies for SEO. I go online, I read those blogs with all those um, weird terms and stuff to help people um, get higher up in Google rankings. Okay. Topic very interesting to everyone in this room, I'm sure. Do you really care about what he just said, though? Do you really? Do you? Thanks. He's my fan. So. <laughs> That's biased. Yeah. Okay, let me ask a different question. You're a business person that Chris is talking to. What do you really care about? Yeah, about the first five seconds. About the first five. He did. He said, you said everything. I make Google like you. I get you high search rankings so people can find you. Nobody cares about all the rest of the stuff. And, 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 and let me qualify that. A technical, if you're talking to Marsha, she cares about all that SEO type <laughs> stuff. She's weird. The rest of us, I don't care about all that stuff. I want to know, how do I get my page to the top of that listing? And if you're the guy that can do it, and you tell me how you do it at a high level. So what do you do to make that happen? One, two, there's different things. First, make sure your website is responsive. That means, means it works on a mobile phone, because now Google is mm -hmm. Xing people out. You're like, you don't work on a mobile phone? Goodbye. Okay, so got to be responsive. What else? Uh, another way I check keywords that uh, people are using and go into Google and see the words that people are typing in okay. and then um, use those words to help okay. the site be further. What if Chris were to say, hey, I'm Chris. I work at web.com, and I'm the guy that knows all the stupid rules that Google puts in place that controls whether your site is at the top of the list or the bottom of the list. My job is to look at your site make sure you got the right stuff, not the wrong stuff, so you're at the top and not the bottom. That's it, right? Because what, what message did I just give you? Yeah. Value. What's the value? Uh, top or bottom? Results. Okay. <laughs> it's results. Do you want to be at the top or the bottom? You want to be at the top? Call me. You want to be at the bottom? Do whatever you're doing right now. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. What, what does that on Absolutely. Absolutely. If he's talking to Marcia, he's going to tell a different version of that opening. Okay? If he's. And most of us don't care. Well, yeah. And if you think about most business people, they've heard the terms. And here's, here's the thing, and, and please hear me clearly. People may have heard the terms, it doesn't mean they have a clue what you are talking about. They've heard about SEO. They've heard about search engine optimization. They've heard about keywords. Do you think they really know what that all means? So, no, because if they knew what it meant, they'd be able to do it themselves. They don't understand it. And it's any business. You get a tax accountant talking about IRS form 4922. I don't care. Just keep me out of jail. <laughs> Seriously, right? It's result oriented. So, so boil it down to what do the people you're talking about or talking to really care about? Now, if you're talking to the IT f guy for a larger company, it's going to be a very different intro. If you're in a small business networking, if you're going to an interchanges networking event, for example, I'd use the one we just did here. Simple, fast, simple, fast. Help people understand what you do quickly. And like Rick said earlier, get them to ask you more questions. Because someone who knows the stuff will say, oh, Chris, so tell me more about exactly how you do that. Well, now I've asked the question. He's going to tell me all sorts of stuff. All right. So try, try a revised version okay. of your intro. Hello, my name is Chris Jones, and I work for web.com. And I work in their SEO department. That's just a, a fancy word. I just help. If you have a website or a web page or content, I help you get from the bottom to the top in the Google rankings. So when people on their phone are searching for something, they can find your product or your brand. Okay, how much better is that than where he started? Nice job. Thank you so much. Good job. Very good. We overthink this stuff way too much. Yeah. We, try to, we try to give people way too much information. The, the old idea of a 30-second elevator speech, toss that. Typically, you can do it in about 15 to 20 seconds. Who wants to come up? We got a, we got a few minutes. We got to try. Come on up. Is that Kurt? Tell us a story, Kurt. Hi, uh, hi, I'm Kurt. I'm a health and wellness educator. Um, a lot of people know that there's toxic things in your home. What would you say is the most toxic thing in your home? Cleaners. Your toothpaste. <laughs> okay, now you have my attention. Uh, <laughs> it's good. 
The toothpaste contains fluoride. If you look on your label of your toothpaste, it does say do not swallow. If ingested, call poison control. Did not know that. So I help people understand what uh, toxins are in their home, uh, in their bodies, and how to get them out, and how to use uh, essential oils, which are God's original medicines, to uh, give us a good health and wellness. All right, is there some awesome material yeah. in that yeah, intro? Yeah. There's, there's some awesome stuff. Let's just take it to the whole new level. Especially when you've got something that people will go, seriously, I did not know that, which you did to me twice. That's good stuff. And every business, every project has those things. Sometimes we have to look for them. And again, I'll go back to Wally. I'm sure you can think of something, you could probably walk up to the front of a building and go, you know what? I have a story that talks about a horror story or a nightmare in relation to this one little thing I see. Am I right? Yeah. Let's find those stories, build that story library. And, and I love, tell me how you started again. I'm a health and wellness. I'm a health and wellness educator. Mm -hmm. uh, and most people understand that there's toxic things in their home. What would you say is the most toxic? So even that part, let's just, let's trim that down. So I'm, I'm Kurt, I'm a health and wellness educator. What do you think the most toxic substance in your home is? Now notice, I skipped a whole sentence there, went straight to the question. What's the most toxic substance in your home? Any guesses? You all know toothpaste. Come on, tell them toothpaste. No, it's, it's actually toothpaste. Whoa. I know. <laughs> Did you know that every morning, and for most of you hopefully in the evening, you put the most toxic substance in your home into your mouth? If you happen to read the toothpaste label, it says, do not swallow. If ingested, call poison control. How do you feel about brushing your teeth when you go home tonight? Okay, so now I'm getting a bit of humor out of this ew factor. What I do is I help people identify those toxins, eliminate them from their home, and then eliminate them from their body. End of story. Skip all the essential oil stuff until they ask. Because you lay that out there, you, you say, hey, you're putting toxins in your mouth twice a day, and if you ingest it, call poison control, and I help you get rid of that stuff, someone is gonna ask, how do you get rid of it? And now they've opened the door, and now you can go into your full, your full pitch. Yeah, it's, especially when you got good stuff, try it again. I just wanna hear this one again, because I like this one. This is a good one. Okay, so uh, my name is Kurt, I'm a health and wellness educator. Uh, what would you say is the most toxic things in your home? Okay, so let's pause right there. So from a style perspective, how you pause is so critical. Did Kurt have any pause after health and wellness educator and the question? He went, room, because he's trying to get to the toothpaste, okay? Hey, I'm Kurt, I'm a health and wellness expert. Pause, big pause, and lower your tone of voice. What do you think the most toxic substance in your home is? Hmm. Because you gotta set up the question. So think about it, think about t-ball. Do you have kids? Uh, 26 year old. Well, when they were little, they might have played t-ball. Think of t-ball, you know that process of teeing the ball up, sitting it there, then the little guy gets up there and he lines it up and then misses anyway? Well, what most of you do is you miss that ball when you've got that great line. The setup so often is that pause, it's a change in tone of voice. So again, think, just listen to the difference. Hey, I'm Kurt, I'm a health and wellness expert. Uh, what do you think the most toxic substance in your home is? Versus, hey, I'm Kurt, I'm a health and wellness educator. <laughs> if I could say educator. I'm a health and wellness educator. Now, what do you think is the most toxic substance in your home? How much different is that second version? Where I'm even pausing out the question, what is the most toxic substance in your home? So it's now personal, it's toxic, it's in your home, and now your brain is triggering all sorts of fear responses. This is part of your brain, it's called the croc brain. Um, um, pitch anything, I don't remember the author's name right now, or, um, Orlin Kraft, talks about the croc brain. If you can trigger that croc brain, which is that primal fear, you win. You will always win. He's got toxic in your home. And then he extends it to toxic in your mouth. You're gonna to listen to everything else he has to say. Try it again, pause it out, slow it down. Hello, I'm Kurt, I'm a health and wellness educator. 
what would you say is the most toxic thing in your home today? Cleaners. Actually, no. There the second. Your toothpaste. It is a cleaner, but it's in your mouth. Okay. Much better than the first one. Now, and here's where we fine tune this. When he gets the response of cleaners, I, I would, because you said, no, actually, that's number two. I would go, hmm, nope. <laughs> toothpaste. Get rid of all the extra words. Because what you're doing is you, now you're building up the impact of that. You don't want to bury the impact with all those extra words. Just, mm, nope. Toothpaste. No. Yeah. Wally, believe it or not. I knew it was coming and it still got me. I know. <laughs> this is, okay. So do you see how intentional this is? And this should be so intentional that anytime Kurt delivers that, it's just natural. He just does it every time. When I'm working with clients, the deal that I have with their staff, and when we do introductions like this with, with uh, sales staff and executive teams all the time, the deal is, if I see you walking down the hallway, I'm gonna ask you for your intro right here, right now, wherever we are. And I will literally see people, they'll see me coming down the hall and they will change direction. <laughs> I will track them down when I see them do that and now they're definitely doing their story. Because it should be that natural. If you're not practicing this stuff, it's never going to get that natural. And people don't, people don't practice. How many times do you think I've given this talk? Thousands. I, mean, I don't even know how many. But does it sound like I've delivered it thousands of times? Yeah. No, it's because I do this improvisational stuff and we have fun. It's the same class pretty much every time. But it's practiced, it's rehearsed. I know what the key messages are. Try it one more time, Kurt. Great. Hi, I'm Kurt. I'm a health and wellness educator. What would you consider is the most toxic thing in your home today? Uh, cleaning supplies. No. It's toothpaste. No. No. <laughs> Seriously? Got him again. No. Got him again. <laughs> and we're sitting down with Wally. <laughs> toothpaste uh, is the most toxic thing in your home. If you read the label, it says do not ingest. If you do swallow it, call poison control. The only part you missed is that we put it into our mouth twice a day. And the reason that's important, so again, think about the, the structure. When I have you putting that toxin in your mouth twice a day, I'm re-triggering that crock brain, I'm refiring that fear center, because we already got you on that most toxic thing in your home is your toothpaste. Now you're, you are intentionally putting it in your face twice a day. You can visualize it, and there's part of your body, whether you like it or not, and then Wally's an extreme reaction, but your body's going, ooh, every time. <laughs> that is an alternative. I don't know that the uh, Dental Association would approve of that, but it works. <laughs> All right, I'll give you some, some new ideas? Yes. Good. Very good. Thank, Thank you for playing. Much. Appreciate it. All right. Clear communication ultimately comes down to that intent, being intentional, giving the thought, the forethought to what are you going to say, why are you going to say it, and how are you going to say it. The reason I do these role plays is to show you how big of a difference it makes, but also how quickly you can achieve that difference. You just have to put in the time. Um, we have a few minutes for questions. Other questions, fire away. Are you going to have this video available? I have no idea. Are we going to have the video available? Yes. Yes, we are. Yes, this is Scott from um, the internet. Wait, do you, what? Just say where you're from. Internet video guy. Thank you. Scott, Scott the internet video guy. He's our new sponsor, and he's going to have the recording at each event. So we're going to have Yeah, so it will be available. Mary. One of the hardest things I find whenever I speak is that I get all wound up and nervous and it all flies out of my mouth. I'm going mm -hmm. so fast people cannot absorb it. Yep. And so that's the hardest part is for me to have those pregnant pauses so people can absorb. So I normally plant someone in the back that tells me to slow down. Okay. How do you do it? Practice. You've got to practice. Uh, Depending, if you're doing a talk, so if it's a new talk, for example, if it's a, how long of a talk would it be? A 15 minute, half hour? 45 minutes. 45 minute, 45 minute talk, you should be starting to develop that talk no less than three months in advance. By 30 days in advance, you need to, your content needs to be dialed in and you are practicing. And it's intense practicing. Um, 
the internet video guy and I were talking about this earlier. Once you practice it, then you practice yourself on video. And here's the, <laughs> you already know what that's like. Here's the thing, if you're doing a presentation, video yourself, just use your iPad, your cell phone, whatever. And then here's what I want you to do. Listen to it, don't watch it, just listen to it. You'll go, ew. Then watch it, but at double speed. When you watch it at double speed without the audio, you see all the weird little things your body does. I had one lady, professional speaker, turns out she spent the entire talk like this. She was like a little T-Rex or something. Just something she developed. We all develop those things. After you've listened to it and watched it at high speed, now you watch it and listen to it and you're so embarrassed that you fix things. Okay? It's a process, you've got to do it. When you go to these major conferences and you watch these big keynote speakers, they've delivered those talks over and over and over again. And pick the best of the best. When they're delivering a new talk, if you know what you're watching for, you can tell it's a new talk. You, know, you can hear it, their timing is just not quite right. Think of comedians. If you ever watched a comedian, their timing was just not quite right. They either are a bad comedian or they're using new material. Um, here's another way, this is one of the things one of my coaches taught me. Go to the Comedy Zone regularly. Watching comedians is one of the best ways to learn how to pace material. The, the humor comes out of your everyday life. Every single one of us in this room have done enough stupid crazy things, or our clients have, we got endless supplies of humorous material. Don't try to create humor, just find it in your content. And by watching good comedians who draw on real life, you can actually learn how to do that in your talks. Yeah, yeah that's, it gives, me, it gives me a great reason to go to the Comedy Zone, have a drink, watch some comedy. It's, I make it a business expense. Wally. I wanted to share a few thoughts to really reinforce what you said to us. Scripting, rehearsal, and coaching, and, and a little bit of a loop. I spoke last, last, last month. Week. I met with Mark before giving the presentation, and we went over it. I've done that same presentation a zillion times before, and I've done it six times, including today, since I was here before. So things that appear natural are actually hyper-rehearsed. Mm -hmm. To the third point, so the scripted and rehearsed. Audio, video, people you know and trust, a Google Hangout with somebody that will do it with you, and you push and push and push until it appears natural. To the point of coaching, it puts you on the spot. How many tens of thousands of dollars have you spent <laughs> between NSA conferences, individual coaches, and going other places that, that leads into being able to sit on a stool and it feels like it's the first time it's been done. Yeah, and it's, oh, over the last, well, I've been doing this 10 years. God, it's got to be, oh, that's a whole different number. It's over over the last 10 years, it's got to be $250,000. Wow. I, have, I have one coach that I spend five grand for a half day, and I have to fly to Baltimore. I share that, and you have an opportunity to sit with somebody to get you, you're not going to spend a poor, I, I, I spend a lot of money too. Spend a lot of money. You don't need to do that unless you're doing what he does professionally. To up your game above your peers is pennies on the dollar. Oh, yeah. To get a little bit of personal one on one so that you're comfortable and you're smacking the crap out of your competitors because what do people say? I don't, I don't like to talk to people. I don't like to do it. I'm, okay, good. Get a professional to help you craft your little shtick, and you'll murder your competitors. Yeah, and it and it's it's sad because I see business owners all the time say, "Oh, I don't want to spend two, three grand to refine my message and my speaking skills." It's like you're nuts. You're nuts. You know? You have to invest in yourself. You have to invest, and if you if you think of the skills that, that so many people invest in, the payback may not ever be there. Your speaking skills you will have for the rest of your career. Unlike SEO stuff and social media stuff that's outdated tomorrow, your communication skills, once you've got them, you never lose them. And you just use that as a, as a building block. That's so true. I mean, I have to go back when I was a child and I had a lisp and I went to a speech therapist and she helped me perfect my speech and I enunciate 
fairly well, and it's all based on when I was in elementary mm -hmm. school and that repetitive training. Of course, she gave me prizes and stuff like that. But I have gold sticky stars I give people sometimes. <laughs> but I mean, it's the repetitive and just hearing mm -hmm. yourself. Nobody likes to hear or see themselves, and you better get used to it. If you have yeah. your own business. Well, and if you're not recording your presentation, whether it's a sales presentation, you're delivering proposals at, at JEA, you know, whatever you're doing, find a way, have your cell phone sitting on the table recording yourself, go back and listen to it. You really want to shock? Have it transcribed. Go to Rev.com. Rev.com charges a buck a minute for transcription. I use them all the time. You read what you said, then you'll really be embarrassed. Yeah. I do that with a presentation like tonight. I'll go back and I'd redline probably well, tonight I actually feel pretty good. I'd probably still redline 15% of what I said. Well, Google, Google does that mm -hmm. now, too. Yeah, I haven't had such good luck with that, but I haven't tried it lately. To, to Mark's point over the transcript, if you record yourself and have a transcribe and you really go, oh, God, that was goofy, fix it how you want it. Yeah. And then, then read it and record mm -hmm. it and see how you sound. Yeah. And you continue to do that until you like what you heard, you will kill other people. Well, and the other thing, just to finish off, and then I'll give the floor back to you. It's one other habit that everybody has at varying times to varying degrees. And it's annoying little words that we pick up that permeate every sentence. And unless you listen to a recording, you won't hear it. I did a series of videos probably four years ago. And every sentence started with the word now. Now, da 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 da, now, now, let's talk about this. Now, 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 now. Well, went back and, and I, of course, I recorded hours of video, didn't watch any of it, went back and thought, okay, that was stupid. Had to re-record all that. Couldn't have been more than three months later. I did the same thing again, recorded a bunch of videos, but the word had changed from now to so. So, 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 so. It's like, oh, you sound like an idiot, right? Your challenges are going to continue to change and evolve. You're going to fix one, and then you pick up a new one. And sometimes it's when you go and see another speaker and they're doing something repetitive, and then you pick it up. It happens. It's been, it's been a pleasure. We'll hang around for a few minutes. Uh, you've got Thank some giveaways. You so You're welcome. Yes, we do. And